our passage of Scripture this morning is in keeping with the Sunday before Independence Day. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. If you're looking at your pew Bible, it is page 1844. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Paul writes and says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and humankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. This morning we're talking about prayer as it applies to our citizenship. As Christ followers, we have dual citizenship, right? We are citizens of this country, this nation, but we are also citizens of heaven. Since we're talking about prayer, I want to begin maybe by taking a load off. How many of you at one time or another have struggled in your prayer life? Let's just confess, okay? I'm raising my hand not to prompt you, but because it's been equally true of me. Prayer can be so mysterious, right? And it can be intimidating, especially when we think there's someone else who's doing it better, as if prayer can be reduced to a formula or technique. Prayer can be discouraging. Do you go through seasons where It feels like God is closer than your next breath, your next thought, your next feeling. You and God are so tight. And then do you go through seasons where, in the words of Bob Dylan, you're knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door and nobody seems to be answering? This is our humanity when it comes to prayer. Here's how I want to take a load off. By showing you a picture. It's not on the screen. It wouldn't help for you to see it on the screen. Our 17-month-old granddaughter, Sylvie, uh, created this for me and gave it to me for Father's Day. If you and I were looking at it together, we would agree that this is a picture of we have absolutely no idea. But, to me, The works of Michelangelo, Rembrandt, you name it, uh, pale in comparison to this. For one thing, she already knows how to paint on both sides of the canvas. So why do I feel this way about this picture? Because the one who made the picture is holding her grandpa's heart in her hand. And I just think it is the most exquisite thing I've ever seen. Here's what author Richard Foster says about prayer. In the same way that a small child cannot draw a bad picture, so the child of God cannot utter a bad prayer. In the same way that a small child cannot draw a bad picture. The child of God cannot utter a bad prayer. Probably some of them need a little translation. And there's that wonderful verse in Romans 8 that talks about the Spirit interceding with groanings too deep for words. But I really want us to relax together as we move through this passage and talk about prayer. Paul says in verse 1, As your top priority, I strongly encourage you to pray for all people. 
all people. Did you notice in the New International Version, the Pew Bible, that there were actually four different words for prayer? Here's another way of looking at it. Ask God to help them generally and specifically. Intercede on their behalf urgently and boldly and give thanks for them. There's this account in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is at the home of Peter's mother-in-law. She is very, very sick with a high fever. It's out of control, spiking. They come to Jesus, and you know what they ask him? Help her. There's a good prayer. Help her. And Jesus takes it from there and heals her. And so when we pray for all people, we're basically letting go. For me, the heart of prayer is relinquishment. When I am praying for someone else, I am letting them go in God's presence. And when I pray for myself, I am letting me go in God's presence. So if we think of intercessory prayer, which is prayer for other people, you can even, as I do frequently, put your hands in your lap and, and close them like this, and when you name a person in God's presence, just open your hand. We're kind of working from the outside in when we do that. We are signaling our heart that it's not on us, that we are letting go in God's presence. But what do we do with this word all? We're to pray in this way for all people. Everybody in your life. The people who are in your life by choice. The people you want in your life. But also the people who are in your life by circumstance. And you don't necessarily want them in your life. But they're in. The people who receive a thumbs up from you but also the people who receive a thumbs down from you. No exceptions. Here's a little exercise. In addition to the faith exercise at the end of this sermon, um, if you have ill will towards somebody, let go of them in God's presence for 31 days and check off every day. At the end of that 31-day period, um, See what your heart is like toward that person. Paul continues in verse 2, Pray this way for leaders in high places and all who are in authority, which in 2019 would include all elected officials. When the Apostle Paul wrote this, probably... A man by the name of Nero was the Roman emperor. He was a nasty piece of work, that one. <laughs> he had his brother murdered. He had his wife murdered. He had his mother murdered. And when he started persecuting Christians and got a taste for it, he would burn them alive for entertainment. Just think about the fact that that stuff was maybe going on when Paul wrote Timothy in Ephesus and said, pray this way for leaders in high places. And, and by this time, the Roman Empire had become an emperor cult. They prayed to Caesar, and it was the law that you had to pray to Caesar. Paul's being a little bit risky here when he swaps out to and replaces it with all. Have you noticed that we tend to deify our human leaders? Sometimes elections sound to me like we're hunting for a new Messiah figure and we forget that that position has already been filled. We, we prop our leaders up on pedestals and then we kick the stool out from under them and we villainize them or even demonize them. So I think it is so good that we are in this verse this morning where we are instructed to pray for all elected officials. 
the ones we like, the ones we don't, the ones we voted for, the ones we didn't, the ones we agree with, the ones we disagree with. No exception. And, and when Paul says pray this way, what he means is ask God to help them generally and specifically. Intercede on their behalf urgently and boldly and give thanks for them. Prayer transcends politics. Prayer is citizenship at its very best. Pray this way for leaders in high places and all who are in authority so that, it's a purpose clause, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Hmm. So it turns out praying for our leaders is our best chance for peace. If you've ever read the Message Bible, you know who Eugene Peterson was. He's in heaven now. He said, a changed world begins with us, and a changed us begins when we pray. And that's the revelation. Praying for other people benefits us. It decentralizes us. When we pray for other people, we are moving out of self and maybe a little narcissism. And we have a good chance to become peaceful, quiet, spiritually centered, spiritually grounded. And doesn't our world and our nation need more people who are peaceful and quiet and spiritually centered and spiritually grounded? To illustrate, I'm going to tell a story on me that does not cast me in the most favorable light. In my younger years, I was an impatient driver. Whenever somebody would pull out in front of me or have the nerve to drive slower than me, I wouldn't exhibit road rage, but the temperature inside the car would be warming up a little bit. And one day when I was driving and someone had just did that and I was fuming, God spoke to me wordlessly, silently, but very clearly and said, Rick, from now on, whenever somebody pulls out in front of you or drives slower than you, that's somebody you're to pray for. And so I started doing it. I spend a lot of my drive time praying for people who pull out in front of me and drive slower than me. So here's the thing. I drive a 2012 red Ford Focus. When you need prayer, find me, <laughs> pull out in front of me, drive slower than me, and you're going to get prayed for. I believe God is answering those prayers. When I thank God for those people that I don't know, and when I ask God to bless them and bless them and bless them and bless them because they're still in front of me, I believe it's mattering. I believe God does something with that prayer. But the plot twist that I never saw coming is that I'm a different kind of person behind the wheel. I'm rarely impatient behind the wheel anymore. And when somebody pulls out in front of me or drives slower than me, and Carla's nodding her head because she's seen it in action, I kind of chuckle because I know, okay, God, you put somebody else in my life to pray for that. Person. So it is with our leaders and with the other people in our lives. Verse 3, this kind of praying is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. The eventual redemption of everyone is God's end game. All. The last time I looked, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. And God chooses to use our prayers to bring people into grace. Max Lucado says, Our prayers may be awkward, our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. In my previous pastorate, there was a woman in the church family named Dorothy Wilson. By the time I arrived on the scene, 
Dorothy was in a nursing home. She couldn't see anymore. She could barely hear. She could barely move. And she sat in that little room in her nursing home, and she prayed. That's how she spent her days. Ever so often, I would get a call from Dorothy. I would always know it was Dorothy. She didn't identify herself. She wouldn't have to. Her voice was lower than mine and very gravelly. And she would say, Preacher, something's going on in the church. Fill me in so I can be praying. And you know what? Something was, of course, something's always going on in a church family. But something was going on. So in that little nursing home room, this person who couldn't see, could barely hear, could barely move, Dorothy and God were together all the time. All the time. Her little corner of the world was one of the most potent places on the planet. When you feel like you are making the least difference, that may be when you are making the most difference. And so remember, in the same way that a small child cannot draw a bad picture, so the child of God cannot utter a bad prayer. You'll see in your worship bulletin where it says sermon and all of that stuff, there's a faith exercise. And the faith exercise is this. Through the empowering grace of Christ, spend more time praying for other people than you spend praying for yourself. That's our faith exercise for the week. And I would love to know how it's going. If it's going well, I would like to know that. If you're stuck, I would like to know that. If it's not going well, I would like to know that. Because we are all in this together. Let's pray together. God, thank you again that you hear, you respond. God, thank you for this challenge from the scriptures. We step in to this challenge. When we know how to pray and when we don't, when we're confident, when we're not, when we want to, when we don't want to, God, we step into this challenge because you always want to hear from us more than we want to speak to you. God, change our perspective. Cause us to see you as always leaning in, ready to embrace our prayers. In Jesus' name.